and welcome to the third talk of the 2022 Ottawa Sailing Community Winter Speaker Series, hosted by the Nepean Sailing Club. My name is Stephen Kidd, and I'm your MC this evening. The series has nine more talks after tonight, one every Wednesday evening at 7.30 p.m. until April 6th. The full listing of the talks is on the NSC website, nsc.ca. All the talks are being recorded and you'll be able to see them on YouTube. Just search Nepean Sailing Club there. Well, you know, we're in our 16th year of these talks and we hold them to get sailors together during the winter, to inform and entertain, and to raise donations for the Legacy Fund to support youth, able, and other sailors in their training and participation in regional, national, and international competitions. While these talks are free, we typically pass the beer jug when we're meeting in a clubhouse for contributions to the Legacy Fund, but uh, last year we hadn't figured this out, but this year we started using Eventbrite, and that system has enabled us to collect donations online and uh, encourage you to contribute as able. So we thank you very much for your generosity. It's working, it seems, well. Well, these talks are organized by three of us who work together on everything. Tony Wright, behind the scenes, is our sharp web guru doing all the web work to publicize the talks and has become our Zoom meister, continually researching and learning how to do more and more and more. He never ceases to amaze me. Park Davis majors on the MC duties, but gives experienced wisdom and oversight to the effort. He was the founder when he served as PR director many years ago, 16 years ago. And I help with finding speakers, scheduling, and I mostly work behind the scenes with Tony each Wednesday evening, filling in for Park as MC when needed. We'd like to welcome a new member to our team this evening, Ron Evans, to the Winter Speaker Series team. Ron is going to be taking over the video post-production editing and he brings a new level of expertise and sophistication to the effort. So you'll likely see these talks on YouTube with even better quality and a whole lot more quickly than up till now. A very hearty thank you, Ron. If you'd be interested in helping us out with the speaker series, we'd love to hear from you. Last year, Melanie Aubert helped behind the scenes as well and as occasional MC. And it was wonderful to have a woman on board with us. But this year, alas for us, she was able to spend the winter on her boat down south, poor thing. So it'd be great to have somebody else join us, especially any women who are interested. And by the way, I know, and we all know that there are a lot of knowledgeable and experienced sailors among you. And if you'd like to speak or know somebody who has uh, some interesting experience or a story to tell, please contact any of us or write an email to publicrelations at nsc.ca. Good, all right. So um, tonight, what we're going to do is we're gonna talk about racing training opportunities at Nepean Sailing Club. And that will be followed by breakout rooms. We'll have different people first uh, explaining. Uh, well, Mike Roper will be explaining what these racing opportunities are, these training opportunities. And then we'll go into breakout rooms for 20 minutes. There'll be six rooms to choose from. And I'll explain a little later how you can just jump from room to room and talk with people there. Each room will have a host that you'll uh, hear from tonight and meet there. And you can talk there as long as you like and then just jump to another room and I'll explain how to do that. Then after that first breakout room session, we'll have one design presentation. So we have 10 of our fleet reps or people standing in for fleet reps who will uh, talk about their own class of boat. And it'll be uh, very interesting. Then we'll have another breakout room session of about 10 minutes where you can go and meet them and talk to them about their boats. Uh, some people are very interested in acquiring a boat or crewing on a boat and you'll be able to uh, ask questions and interact with the hosts there who have presented and uh, they'll have more information for you as well. Great. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to our fleet captain, Dominic Goodwill, to talk about, sorry, 
to give us a brief introduction uh, for the evening. Dominic. Thank you, Stephen. You should be able to see and hear me. So um, I have the privilege of serving as the fleet captain at the European Sailing Club, but that means I'm on the board of directors and I'm responsible for, for facilitating uh, all the organized sailing activities, sailing and boating activities that uh, the club offers. So uh, the Nepean Sailing Club and with our partners of Britannia jointly deliver the largest sail racing program in North America. We have in a normal year, 80 race nights, 308 race starts. I counted that for the most uh, recent normal year, 17 long distance races, eight training and seminars, six virtual race practices, five regattas, uh, dinghy rental for, for nearly five months, four fun sailing events, three days of frostbite racing and the Ottawa River Challenge, which is a huge, huge program. Uh, we share the water with our friends at uh, a Club de Voile de Grand Riviere, the Air Mille Club, uh, and the Lac de Chêne Sailing Club and the Canada Sailing Club. They all run their own race programs as well. And there's regular participants, for example, from the Pien at the uh, Elma CBGR uh, uh, races, uh, Kilbert races. Um, so uh, having access to all this uh, activity is a tremendous benefit of being a member of a sailing club here. And Nepean, this only happens because of the core, the core of 30 volunteers, they're called the, the fleet committee, and seven staff members, uh, both full and part-time, uh, backed by 200 volunteers who help with race committee duties, you know, the, the, the help you guys all give on race nights. So that, that's a huge team, and, and uh, I thank them all. Uh, so the volunteers find it immensely satisfying to be involved with an operation of this scale and success rate. And there's wonderful opportunities to increase your skill and to work with interesting people joining us in different roles, uh, which we're going to talk through uh, uh, in some, some of tonight's uh, activities. Just imagine the satisfaction of placing a racing mark at just the right place, knowing you've got, done a good job and laid it well. And 100 sailors go by on their race boats, of different boats, and they all recognize that you did a great job and helped set a great uh, course, for example. Uh, we're very open. You can find the list of the uh, core team uh, on the NSC Racing webpage. Uh, look for the uh, Fleet Operations Fleet Committee. You can find all our names there and, and what, what roles we play. There's many, also many ways to participate as a racer, whether as a rookie or, or an experienced sailor looking for a cool new boat to own or to jump on as crew. So in that context, the one design racing is the sharp end of racing. And are some of the best, also some of the best support communities of uh, uh, like-minded uh, like boat owners. So we're presenting tonight many of our one design fleets. Of course, as much, pretty much any sailboat or dinghy or cat can participate in racing activities here at, at various levels of, from relaxed to competitive. Um, to keep our, our operation sustainable, we've assembled a uh, menu of off-season and uh, early season trading opportunities to offer to you, which are going to be presented tonight. And you can find a post on these uh, as of today on the Nepean uh, uh, website uh, homepage uh, related to, to sailing better and also to working in our racing operations group. Um, to that end, Steve, I'd like to thank Stephen Kidd and Mike Roper, kindly volunteer to coordinate these fleet training opportunities. And also I'd like to thank uh, uh, our professional uh, staff member, our sailing activities manager, Sean Batten. I thank them for their energetic and fast progress. So with that, I will turn it back to the host. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominic. All right, well, I'd like to uh, call on Mike Roper, who is our race practice coordinator to present uh, all of the opportunities. I'm just going to share my screen again. Mike, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Stephen. So as Dominic said, um, we were challenged by him early in the season to end of last season really to uh, come up with this program that um, I'll start my video come up with a program that would help to do these three things and um, most of the ideas came from Dominic I would say but we've been able to flesh them out and, and we're starting to put them into practice 
So the goals were to, as I said, it, the club racing takes a large effort and we want to make sure we have continuously new blood coming in to help us re run our races regardless. And it's the same on the race course, um, to keep our fleet strong, to bring in new races, to start racing and also to help our current races improve. Um, so those are three goals and we've got a program of 10 different activities that are helping us towards that. The first one is uh, virtual race practice. And this has already started. It's an online race training program. And it's basically a fun race you can do online, racing against other club members um, on, I think it's every Tuesday night. Yes, 7.30 to 8.30. Uh, the dates are there, and there's information on how to join on the website under virtual race practice, as well as under the, uh, the general announcement for this program. Um, I think there's been two sessions so far, and um, everyone that's been seems to have had a great time. So I'd recommend checking this out if you're at all interested in racing when the river is frozen. Um, our next event is a training course for people who wish to become or interested in becoming club level judges. So these are the people that uh, help provide information or assist with interpretation and application of rules in racing. And um, for example, might be involved in protest committees and that sort of thing. This is Don Serio Sailing Course. It's gonna be in person here at the Sailing Club, here, I said here uh, at the club and it's open to anyone. Um, the only reminder here is that any events at the club are going to require the enhanced vaccination certificates uh, for people attending in person. So that's on February 26th, which is shortly followed, sorry, Stephen, shortly followed by a course seminar being given by North Sales U, also in person at the club and open to anyone in the area. This is a full day course that runs from nine till four. And it's a, a very good course on uh, racing tactics. So it's not going to tell you how to go fast necessarily or how to tune your boat or your sails. It's more about learning how to apply the rules and uh, how to gain a, an advantage over your competitors uh, in turn, around the race course, both, both by applying tactics related to rules and uh, weather conditions, how things change on the course as the race goes on. So it's, uh, it's a good, good course. Um, it's uh, sign up and registration is through North Sales U. You can go to their website and it's listed under their seminars. Uh, there is a cost for this. Of, I think it's around $120, but you can find that more on the website. And I can give you some more information in the breakout rooms afterwards. Okay, our next event, now moving into March, is how to help run an NSC regatta. Uh, as Dominic mentioned, there's a lot of people uh, help in running races and regardless, there's a lot involved both in, on the water and in the, in the background. So we've got some excellent speakers here who will be able to give people who are interested in helping out in future or who want to learn how to do more but have helped out in the past to learn about all the different roles that are in running regatta. That's gonna be in person at NSC also. Our next course is a women's race officer course. So race officers are people who manage the on the water parts of uh, racing and regattas. And they will be, this is an opportunity for the women in our club to get trained and certified as club race officers. This is gonna be online over a couple of weeks. And it's actually open to any, any from, from anyone, anyone from any club, I should say, any lady from any club. And that's April 4th to 5th and also 11th and 12th. Next course is also related to race training. And this is Mark Lane. Um, we have a good example of a Mark and some boats going around it here in this picture. So this is specifically how to set racing marks, which sounds fairly simple, but in fact, requires a bit of skill and practice to make sure they, they end up in the right place and to be able to move them efficiently and safely and without getting the uh, anchor wrapped around your propeller and that sort of thing. So this will be a course that will provide some uh, guidance on all those aspects related to setting rock racing marks. That will be um, sometime in May when the water is open and the, the harbor is open. It will be in person at NSC and on the water. Starting at the end of May, we have keelboat race practice. Um, this is a short course we ran 
I think it's three years ago now. It's been uh, it's been sidelined by floods and COVID recently, but it's a uh, it's a chance to allow keelboat skippers to practice starts and some up and downward legs. But it's not a race; it's a practice session only. So it's non-competitive. We run it in the evenings. We start off with a briefing session, so for completely no one who's ever tried going around a race course before can understand how it's set up, how they how they start, how they go around it, and how they finish. And um, it's also a chance for any experienced keelboat racers to come out and get their crews tuned up at the beginning of the season. So this will be three Friday evening sessions, late May and early June. Our next activity also in May with, with a date TBD. This is a, a, uh, an initiative from the fleet to help people who are uh, involved in regattas in particular, but any other on water events to learn to drive the fleet power boat safely. They all have slightly different characteristics, handling characteristics, way to start and stop the engines, way to get the anchors up and down. And so this is a chance to get it to people that are involved in that familiar with the boats so we can use them safely and without damage to themselves or the boat. And this course follows on, well, it's not a course, it's actually a race. And it follows on from the keelboat race practice as a way that uh, now, whereas that course, that course is just a practice session, this is actually a race, but we're putting it in a fairly um, a low stress environment, I would say. It's a time trial format. So there's usually a, a one hour window for you to start in this, and then you're timed around the course. And, uh, places and prizes are given out accordingly. So the races will be scored, the boats will be registered, it will be run like one of our regular races, but without all the uh, excitement and panic of a start line, which can be a little intimidating for the people that are the first time going out. But we think that by the time people have, have had a chance to do this, if they're beginning races, they'll be more than ready to move on to uh, one of the race series in the summer. So this is four Monday evening races on the 6th, 6th to the 27th of June. It'll be a course on Lac de Chien, and um, we'd ask this one just for beginner races, please. And I think the last event on our, on our program is going to take place between June and August, and it's another session to get uh, dinghy racers or want to be racers uh, trained. So this has been run by Sean Ban, and it'll be part of our uh, dinghy rental program. So. Uh, one session will be planned in June, one in July and one August, and it will be a, a, an afternoon session of a few hours, fairly informal, with a race course set up somewhere in, near the close to the club. So there'll be more information on this from Sean later on. And I think that's, yeah, that's pretty much it. That's all 10, a summary of all 10 programs. And uh, we have different breakout. Thank you to uh, those who have prepared and taken on the challenge of a two to three minute presentation, um, kind of an elevator pitch for why you should be interested in their boat. All right, I'm going to close the chat and share my screen again. All right, so we'll start with uh, Peter, Peter Wood, who's talking about the International 2.4 MR class. Are you there, Peter? Uh, yes, I am. And I'd like to start. first, I'd like to thank uh, Dave Bradley, uh, Dominique, uh, yourself, Stephen, Tony, and Park for putting on this uh, presentation. Um, I race one design boats because I can never figure out well on the race course exactly what position I'm in when I'm in sailing handicaps. So in one design, I can count on one hand the boats that are behind me, and I know that if I'm near the bottom of the fleet. So I'm a strong believer in one design racing. Um, the international 2.4 meter is the smallest of the uh, meter rule uh, sailboats that range from the 12 meter right down to our uh, 2.4. And if you look at a 2.4 and you look at a 12 meter, the, the whole shape, they all look the same. Um, the class is active in 22 countries and the major countries are Germany, 
Finland and Sweden. This, uh, the specifications are like the 13 feet, six inches and they're being 30 uh, inches and the draft is three foot, six inches. Uh, they have a displacement of 252 kilos and the class rules require that the boats weigh in between 252 and 254 kilos. Um, who sails the, next please, next slide. Uh, who sails the uh, International 2.4? Well, typically worldwide, 75% of us are able-bodied and 25% of our members are people with uh, physical disabilities. We welcome all. And most sailors are over the age of 50. They have sailed uh, race one design dinghies and open keel boats. And uh, now they want uh, close competitive sailing without the difficulty of finding crew and not wanting to deal with capsizing prevalent in high performance thinking. We can sail those and not be in particularly good physical shape. Uh, the boat is not too sensitive to lighter weight crew and with sailor at range between 50 and 100 kilos. Okay, next slide, please. And in Canada, there are boats in all provinces except PEI. We don't have a lot of boats. I think there's about 65 in all in Canada. Active fleets, Victoria has 18 boats, Toronto, Saskatchewan has six, and Montreal has four boats, Kingston four boats, and the new fleet forming in Hamilton. Here at NSC, we have four privately owned boats, and we're hoping to bring two new boats up in the spring of 2022. Um, they're sitting in Florida right now, and. Uh, and we're going to be uh, hosting a club uh, championship for the for and we're going to ask for fleet reps to uh, come and race the boats uh, and there'll be a round robin series and at the end of it we're hoping that we'll be able to declare somebody as a as a uh, as a club champion it'll be a boat that uh, um, will be equally able to be sailed by uh, dinghy sailors and keelboat sailing uh, we're located at the end of W Dock, and we will probably this summer do a couple of uh, invitations for you to come on out and try the boat. So take a test sail. And we'll see anybody who's further interested in breakout room number one. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Peter. All right. Uh, Dominic. Dominic is going to tell us about the albacores. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, so the albacore. Uh, so the albacore is two-person plane in dinghy, uh, 15 feet or so in length, 240 pounds hull, about 290 pounds all up before you put the people on it. A uh, crew typically with two adults or a parent and one or two kids or two youth. This is the typical crew sets that we see. Uh, you can put three kids on it with a parent if, you, if, you, if you're careful and don't go out in, in uh, too much wind. Uh, and it's good from uh, two knots to 25 knot gusts. Uh, so it's pretty flexible. Next slide. Um, it's, uh, it was one of the foundation fleets at the club. It's been around here for 40 years and pretty much every sailor in Ontario has sailed an albacore at one point. A lot of people come out to me and said, oh, I sailed one of those back in blah, blah, blah. We have one on the lake. We still have one on the lake. Uh, they're low cost. That's uh, they're low maintenance and uh, they're best suited for families. Uh, these are my kids uh, with with uh, my, my boat there. Um, people that want to go out and sail and come home uh, without too much uh, hassle or difficulty. And they're also for people that like close in racing, very tight with minimal repair bills. So if you like to race at your own arm's length from someone, which is truly awesome, uh, but, the, but the cost, of, the danger is, is low. Uh, this is a good fleet for you. Next slide. Um, so uh, how does the Albacore sail? Um, so it is a very simple boat to start because uh, it just has a jib and main. There's no spinnaker, no trapeze. Uh, it's very agile to steer, very light, great balance in the helm, a very, a very nice uh, feedback uh, uh, when the wind, wind is blowing, very good balance. To get that top 5% of speed takes years of practice. I'm told I, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm not there yet, but just to sail it around, it, it, is, it is a straightforward boat. Uh, upwind, it, it points uh, very nicely. 
uh, on a reach, it'll plane uh, when you've got 12 knots uh, of breeze, uh, planes qu quite well. And downwind, uh, very easy to, to, much easier than almost any other boat in the club, because you just, you put it, there's, we have a jib pole, it's a unique albacross system that holds the jib out wing on wing, uh, which makes it very easy to jive, uh, to jive the boat fast. Uh, there's some guys uh, from Toronto and the US uh, uh, planing their boats in uh, God knows how much preset. It can be a bit of a handful, straight downwind in 15 knots, gets a bit rolly. And at 20 knots, you will swim sometimes. So you've got you to be able to handle uh, those kind of events. Next slide. Uh, for racing, in terms of speed, uh, it's a bit faster than a 420 and, and the 2.4 MR. Uh, similar speed boats are uh, lasers, fireballs. We're actually about the same as a 27, a uh, 22 and a shark, uh, as, as proven by uh, uh, a turkey trot, where, where we pretty much sail uh, even with those uh, those big boats. Uh, it's slower uh, and less of a handful than the, than the 505, uh, and of course slower than a 22 or my other boat, the, the G80. Uh, if you want to race well, tack it on every shift, roll tack it using your weight, uh, uh, very dynamic. Uh, sail, sail in tight to, to other boats and uh, push them around. And uh, sailing a boat like this is a great way to learn to, how, how to actually sail because you'll learn much faster than a keel boat because you'll make uh, five maneuvers on one of these every every maneuver you make on a keel boat. So that's the albacore. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much, Dominic. All right, Dave Gardner will talk about the Martin 16. Dave, are you there? Unmute yourself. There, I'm here now. Great, great. <laughs> I, had to I had to talk to myself for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks there, Stephen. Uh, could you go back to the first slide there quickly? Thanks, yeah. Um, thanks, uh, Stephen. So the uh, Martin 16 is uh, part of our ABLE fleet. It's specifically designed for sailors with physical disabilities. Um, the boat has a 300 pound keel and the boat itself can accommodate both a sailor and a companion volunteer. Uh, the program, the Able Sail program with the Martin Fleet has been running for over 20 years um, at the Nepean Sailing Club and the Nepean uh, Sailing Club owns and operates a fleet of five of these boats. Um, the club also provides learn to sail programs uh, for new sailors, and we've also got an uh, intermediate program, and for people that want to get out there and race, um, we also have a racing program uh, where those sailors compete in regattas. Uh, next slide, please. So at the very heart of the uh, program are the sailors and companion volunteers. Um, without those volunteers, it would not be possible to run this program. And uh, I've been volunteering in this program for about 10 years. And for me, it's one of the greatest pleasures. It's, it's lots of fun. Um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, next slide there, uh, please. Thanks. The recreational uh, program is sort of the kickoff for all new sailors, uh, new to the Martin 16. Um, the uh, new volunteers that come on board are provided with training throughout the year. And we're also currently building a library of how-to videos, which serve as a reminder for both new and veteran sailors and volunteers. So uh, if you decide to come out and join us, uh, you'll find that we're a very social group, both on and off the water. Uh, there's lots of encouragement, trash talk on the water, and we love to laugh at our mistakes. Um, next slide, please. Oops, uh, just go back one more, sorry. Um, for those sailors that are interested um, in a little competition, the NSC has a race program and coaching. And it starts with the Wednesday night racing where you are guaranteed to see, guaranteed to see at least four or five Martins out on the water. Um, sailors can sail on their own or with a companion volunteer. Um, but we also have weekend regattas specifically for the Martin fleet, like the National Capital Cup, the Coupe de Quebec, um, our uh, Mobility Cup, where Martin 16 sailors from across the country converge in one location. And uh, also the uh, fleet participates in club regattas like the Nepean One Design and Fanfare. Um, next slide, please, Stephen. 
Um, as I previously mentioned, these boats are specifically designed for sailors with disabilities. The boats can be adapted for all sailors. Uh, we have cape seats, which provide uh, both core body control and can be fitted with special uh, headrests for stability for sailors requiring that. Um, for sailors that have strength or coordination challenges, we have two battery operated auto helms with joystick controls for steering and sail trim. And for sailors with little, little or no hand control, uh, potentially um, upper, upper uh, cervical injuries, which prevent them from using their hands, we have a sip and puff system that allows them to use their breath to steer and trim the sails. So uh, if you're interested in participating in this program, uh, please feel free to contact uh, Michelle Simon, who's our uh, program coordinator, because uh, volunteers keep this program alive for us and you are always welcome. And you do not have to be a club member. Um, we welcome everybody as volunteers to the program. So thank you very much, Stephen. Thanks, Dave, so much. Good, moving along here, uh, Tim Nason, Panzer 22. Steven, you forgot to put your three minute timer up. I think everyone's doing well, but um, so far uh, so good. We're, we're a little bit longer than three, but- uh, I'll, I'll, endeavor to, I'll endeavor to keep it to three then. So yeah, my name is Tim Nason. I'm the fleet rep for the Tanzer 22. I uh, just had a few quick thoughts for folks really geared towards those that might be thinking about getting a Tanzer 22 to race. But if you have a Tanzer 22, or if you're thinking about crewing and you'd like to join the fleet, then please make sure you join us uh, in the breakout session afterwards and we can talk about that. I can give you my contact information. We can kind of go from there. Um, so without further ado, next slide. Next slide, please. I should have said please, sorry. So the Tanzer 22 is an incredibly affordable boat. Uh, it's a full keel sailboat. Um, uh, but um, the prices I've seen are, are on these boats are great. You can get them for pretty much nothing these days. As far as affordability go, I'd say the other thing that's really important with racing is cost of sales. And I can tell you this is one fleet that isn't trying to adopt the latest uh, in high tech sail cloth technology. So you're not going to find that you have to spend money to be competitive in this fleet. Um, next slide. It's uh, an incredibly durable boat. These boats were built in the 1970s and 80s and they laid down lots of fiberglass back then. That's, there's a reason they call them tankers. Um, it's the kind of boat that uh, if you were to bump into another boat during a race, which is known to happen, uh, if it's a, it's a boat with modern technology or modern built boat, it might be a, a fairly significant bit of damage, but your Tanzer is probably just going to need a little bit of gel coat touch up. So there you go. Uh, next slide, please. It's an incredibly comfortable boat. Um, I don't know if you can see here, but for the size of the boat, it's got a huge cockpit. It's a, it's a really comfortable cockpit, very roomy. Makes it really challenging if you actually own a Tanzer to think about, you know, stepping up to another a larger boat because, you know, going up in size, it's hard even then to find one with a, a cockpit as roomy as a Tanzer has. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, comfortable boat to sail, uh, ideal for long distance races. Um, you know, if you're out there for five or six hours, uh, it's a great boat unless you're, you know, wanting to get a good ab workout, in which case I would probably go somewhere else. Um, next slide, please. And convenient. Um, so if you have a look at this picture, you can see these are two boats sailing in a, a jam race. And you can see there's just one crew member and one skipper on each of these boats. So what I mean by convenient is a uh, small crew size. We have, uh, you need two people to sail in jam and three people to run a spinnaker on these boats. So uh, unlike boats that might require five to seven crew members, you only have to organize uh, one or two people uh, on a weekly basis to get out there racing. So it's pretty convenient from that perspective. And finally, I'd just like to say that um, no matter what boat you have, you're gonna have fun racing. I, you know, if you go back to the club after a race, uh, and it's a windy day, everyone's animated, everyone's talking about their stories of survival. And, you know, there's no, there's no group of people moping in a corner because they had to sail on Vipers instead of a great boat like the Tanzer 22. So whatever you're gonna choose will work. <laughs> Thanks. Excellent, thanks so much, Tim. Andrew O'Brien is gonna talk about the CNC 27. 
Yeah, thank you for organizing this and thank you for inviting me to speak. Unlike most of the speakers here, I'm a, we're, I'm a very new boat, relatively new boat owner. We've had our boat for about four years now. Um, but that being said, we did a lot of research before we, we bought it. Next slide, please. So CNCs for us, it was an ideal boat because we wanted to race and we also wanted to cruise. We, uh, the boat has a bathroom, it has a large cockpit, it has a large uh, interior, it has beds, it has stoves. So it, it was great, it was a great balance and there's such a huge uh, CNC fleet in the club that it, uh, that it was really a great choice for us. Most CNCs are um, older boats and they, they don't, most of them don't show a lot of signs of aging. They, uh, they keep their value well and they, um, they keep their, their, Stur their sturdiness well. Um, fairly low cost, um, 10 to 15K. You can probably get one a little bit less or you might even be able to spend a little bit more, but, um, but it gives you a fairly high performance racer, cruiser kind of boat that is very versatile. Uh, if you like to race, we, uh, we race at least two good nights a week, every Tuesday and Thursday, but you can also wait, race on Wednesdays at CV, uh, CVGR, or you can race on Monday in the win women's race. The, uh, the 27s reach very well and they keep up easily with the fleet. They uh, usually lead the cruising sailboats under 30 feet. Um, it's an excellent example of how a properly built boat can last long. Next uh, slide. Uh, the hulls, the first one was built in 1970. So usually, racing at the club it's the mark threes and fours that are racing mainly together there might be a couple of other ones but usually it's a mark threes and fours this and you can go back to this slide later if you want to, to get some specifications next slide please uh fun facts there's over 50 cnc 27s in ottawa so i mean being the the largest racing area in all of north america and also um Having so many CNCs makes it very competitive. Um, interesting, the sheer number of boats in Ottawa, cautions to look for, I would say probably the deck core, but you get a survey and you're okay. And, uh, and there's many ways to learn how to sail. You can uh, come out to their, I think Advantage Boating has two CNCs and you can even sign up on the crew bank. Next slide, please. Um, the, Can I go to one too far? No, that's great. Okay. Um, so the the group of CNC sailors is amazing. They're very com they're very competitive and very friendly. They're um, the boats themselves can handle. They sail fairly well in low winds, but they they actually can handle the high winds. We had a CNC championship once, and we had constant twenty five knots, probably gusting up to thirty five or even more. There's always somebody around to help if you have a question, and we've had a lot of questions. And uh, probably the most fun about uh, the CNC group is that we have raft ups all of the time. Um, you can go to the next slide, you'll be able to see a nice picture of what we did one night when there's no wind. So even if there's no wind, we're still finding uh, something to do. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Thank Andrea. You. Hey, Andrea, will we see uh, the CNC 27 fleet at Nod this year? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> All right. It, it was written on the slide. I saw that slide. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, Elizabeth, Patty, talking about the J22. Yes, uh, thanks for uh, organizing this event. So, the difference between the J22 and the Tunza 22 or the CNC 22 we just uh, uh, viewed is that we have a a fractional, uh, it's a fractional sloop. So that means that the spinnaker or the, the, the jib is not attached to the top of the mast. So that makes it more convenient for people that are not that strong. <laughs> the, the other aspect, so it's a 22 foot long, a bit more than that. It's a, the, the draft is a less than a four feet. And we have also a very wide uh, cockpit, as you can see on the bottom uh, uh, picture. And it's a lively day sailors. And uh, I find a very elegant sailboat. It's not because I have one, but <laughs> I 
and it's not too expensive. It's a fun family boat. It, uh, it's kid and uh, woman friendly. So, and uh, normally it's three to four crew maximum. So I've illustrated pictures where you see uh, uh, two crew that are still able to handle the spinnaker, so that's okay. And you can go up to, normally it's, we were looking for three crew, uh, crew on board, but we can go up to four if it's not too big portions. Next, please. Uh, the boat is uh, relatively easy to maintain uh, at uh, low cost. There is no plumbing, no electricity. It can be dry or wet sailing, depending. Uh, most of the great sailors are, are dry sailors. <laughs> Uh, and uh, the uh, proportion is with the uh, outboard. You can uh, have an uh, electrical outboard if you, if you prefer. Several of the owners have that. And the class is limiting the, uh, the, the size at uh, three and a half uh, horsepower for the outboard. It's fast to launch and all out for trained dry sailors. And you can see on the bottom uh, picture that uh, masting and demasting is done on, uh, on uh, the trailer. And that's uh, Michel Simon trying to, get, to catch up the, the, the mast. And it's easily trailable. So this is why it's, uh, it's a fleet that is uh, attracting uh, uh, competitors uh, because uh, we can go to various competition uh, with the J22. Next, please. So we have the International Class Association, I indicated the, 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 the site, uh, and the Class Association limit the quality and size of the cell and electronic on board. So you don't need to spend a fortune to buy uh, these very new, uh, very expensive cells. They are still that chrome, uh, uh, and, uh, but uh, sellers are changing their cells. So. <laughs> The, we have also the Canadian Class Association. Our president is Michelle Simon. She's very, very active uh, in promoting the J22 and also very well recognized uh, uh, sailor. And we have uh, a site on Facebook. And uh, feel free to ask questions uh, on this site. It's not just for the owners, it's for whoever is interested by the J22. And it's monitored by really great experts that are happy to share uh, their, their knowledge. Uh, and answer the question. So it's a uh, well adapted for these top sellers. The fleet attracted the best local sellers that have a national, international pedigree and are very friendly. Now, right now, we are 11 boats on the Lac des Chênes. Next, please. And we have a nice calendar of championship events. Uh, 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 there is an active fleet in Hudson. Uh, we have NOD uh, that we organize in, uh, in Ottawa. Uh, we don't know where the Canadian uh, will be. Gaspé is also making noise to, to have a championship. We have Lyra. Uh, next year, we'll have the North American out of Kingston. And there is also Lake George that is re regularly organizing a, a, a championship in September. So thanks very much. Uh, we'll see at the breakout room. I give that for, for more information, but that's more for the breakout room. Thanks so much. Yeah. Great. Merci infiniment. And Derek, are you there? Yeah. Derek Lay talking about the J80. Thanks, Derek. Thank, thanks, Stephen. Uh, Derek Lay, uh, we've had our J80 for, uh, I guess, four or five years now. Uh, the thing about the J80 fleet is it's probably the fastest growing one design fleet and uh, gaining strength as we go. Can I have the next slide, please? I asked, uh, because we're gaining, you know, really, Dave and Elizabeth uh, Naismith had their boat first, uh, and starting about five years ago, we started adding two, three a year, uh, up to seven boats now. And uh, I asked people, why did you switch? Why did you, why did you go to the J80? You know, uh, the specs on the left, uh, they're numbers. And, and it's not numbers that you buy a boat for, but what it does tell you is that the boat is incredibly well adapted to the club. It's not too long, it's not too deep. The draft is important. You can actually get in and out of the, the harbor even when it's really low. Uh, and the ballast and displacement are good. So it's, it's a well adapted boat to the lake. It's a well adapted boat to our environment, but why did people want it? That's not why you buy a boat. Uh, 
the, the hardcore racers, the ones who wanted to race as much as they could, they really liked the fact that it does one design and perf racing quite well and uh, can integrate with the fleets Tuesday nights, Thursday nights. Our own situation, actually, we had Nolson 30 before the J80, and uh, the feedback from the Monday night crew, so the women's night crew, was uh, the masthead rig was just too much power. It took too much strength to do the boat. Uh, the number of trained people you need with a four deck with a, with a, a traditional symmetrical sail, the, the line loads and other things, the boat was just too much boat. The J80 takes care of all of that. Uh, it's a very easily shorthanded boat because all the line loads are light. Everything's led back to the cockpit. There's no four deck. You can sail the boat quite easily with uh, with two skilled people. You can race it with two skilled people. You can sail it with one. The furling jib, the asymmetrical spinner, it's a very easy boat to sail um, and a very good community to uh, to build for. Easily trailer. The J22, uh, they talk about the events. J boats are like that. And uh, the J80 is, uh, is no different. You can throw it on the trailer. It's well under the 5,000 pounds that a, that a good sized truck or, or van will pull. And uh, Toronto's just down the road. There's another good sized fleet there. The worlds are going to be on the East Coast this year. Uh, again, it's a it's a dynamic boat and a lot of fun. Can I have the next slide, please? This is uh, the kind of racing you get in a J80. Uh, from the top left is the typical Thursday. You can see us out with the Vipers. Uh, this is a good one design start. Again, sport boat style. Uh, the J80 is not as light as a Viper, so it's not going to pick up in plane as quickly, but it's a much more stable boat. Again, something we get a lot of good feedback from is uh, you We've got a, a nine-year-old, and not only is she comfortable uh, racing it, but she's never once been afraid that she was going to wind up in the water or anything else, and that was important to us. Others, different different style, but uh, that's one of the things that was good for uh, where we were. On the, the top right, uh, this Cheeky Monkey, one of our newer boats, and uh, you can see how close the crosses are. That's a normal thing. Uh, the fleet is... Not only do we have some good racers, and uh, these, these folks are uh, some of the best ones we've got, but... Uh, one of the things you get out of the fleet is that it is always trying to help. Uh, every sailor in the fleet is trying to help the other sailors and build that through community and through uh, through practice. The larger fleets on the bottom. Uh, can I get the next slide, please? Oh, sorry. Before we go, let me go back one. That uh, the top left is just. It's a good idea that this is still a planing boat. It takes a little bit more breeze to get it going, but uh, just a random Thursday night race back in uh, back in September, easily through uh, through 13 knots. To and, uh, and peaking over 14 knots with a boat uh, in the dark downwind to the finish. It was a lot of fun. And uh, we've seen boats with upwards of 15 or 16 knots uh, shown. So it is a boat that can go. Next slide, please. So flexibility, and this is a, a key for some of them. And you can see um, <laughs> you know, free radical there. It is a to totally comfortable boat to go. It is not a CNC 27. You do not have a head. You do not have other things. But it is a good boat to take the family out on cruise, do some small overnights. They regularly they figure they're up to about 80 nights now on that boat, uh, doing up the river and back. Kids driving, no problem. Uh, the bottom right is our daughter last year. Uh, and uh, she, I, I have to fight to get the tiller back for the races now, but she's comfortably driving the boat, uh, doing six or seven knots in 12 knots of breeze on start lines and, and dodging traffic. And uh, it's probably getting a little bit uh, there, but uh, the raft ups and other things. Next slide, please. Community is important, and that's really what we're trying to build in the J80 fleet. And said it's growing. Uh, we're bringing new people in almost every year. Uh, this is a picture from back in November. Dave and Elizabeth Naismith welcomed the new boats to the fleet with uh, battle flags. And the, those flags you'll see a lot of this summer on the boats and, uh, and out on the water. Uh, just a representation. The same type of flag are used in Toronto and elsewhere to, uh, to represent the boats and to, to show at the regattas that the, uh, the community is there. And uh, Dave and Elizabeth have done a phenomenal job of just welcoming people in and building that fleet. And, uh, and you'll see that continued. If you want to come to the JDs, this is what you get. Next slide, please. These are the links. Uh, I don't need to go into them. Uh, thank you very much. And I hope to see uh, a few people into, in the breakout rooms. Uh, have a good evening. Great. Thank you very much, Derek. All right, we move to the fireball with Rune. Yeah, so now after Derek has sold me totally on the J80, <laughs> we're going to go a little bit down in size. Um, so we're going to win some time here too. So the fireball is um, is a, uh, a two-person boat, uh, single trapeze, and uh, with a spinnaker. And so to sort of come put it on the charts um we have to jump back to dominic's 
what he he had a lot of good points in his talk about the albacore. So the albacore is is very similar. It's also a two person boat. What we have on top of that is is the spinnaker and trapeze. And then we're, we, uh, so I normally say that the Fireball is a fast, fun, friendly, one design and international. And uh, I think that's the theme a lot of other fleets are saying, we, the, the fleet are really, they're trying to, to help each other out to go faster because it's more fun when everyone is uh, moving up the ladder a bit. Um, then I put some numbers there on the right side and it's a light hull. So uh, it's really only a little bit heavier than a laser so it's 78 kilograms so they're really uh, uh, what you get for that is it's it's nice to you don't need the crane to put it up on and off the trailer you, it's it's an easy lift for two people uh, it also makes it plane earlier which makes it more fun so it planes off the off the breeze at, at eight knots uh with the kite and um upwind we can plane at 15 knots which is pretty cool um so it's relatively easy to sail but again, I think Dominic also said that, you know, it's, it's really, you can keep on learning for the rest of your life. Uh, and so to get those last percentages that, uh, that makes the difference, that's really, uh, so it, it, it adopt, adapts to, to everyone. And uh, for me, it's really about, I really love the one design aspect. So the, the fireball is, has been fully sorted out for many, many years. So you're free to choose change the rigging inside the boat but the the hull shape and the foils and the sails and all this stuff is all sorted out so my boat that's almost i think it's coming up on 20 years can still actually it it doesn't look any different than a brand new boat i would buy from winder in the uk uh, and the, and it's still down to weight so you could the boat can still win the worlds me not so much but you know um, so for me, the really, you know, the real fun begins when all the boats go the same speed and have the same penalty for maneuvers. So I want all the boats to be identical, so I don't end up blaming the equipment, you know. So then we go to the next. Yeah. I, I, um, so uh, to sum up, uh, what we have locally is that we we have a good local fleet in the dinghy yard. We go to Wednesday night races. Uh, we sort of have we have five active boats at Nepean. And then they have a lot more up the road in Montreal, Point Claire. And, and that fleet is really the reason that I sail Fireball still, because they have three boats there that, that are really sailing at a world-class level. So when they go to the, the Worlds and they go to the UK, they are, they're sailing up in the, in the top 10. And so that is why it's very interesting for me to practice locally and then go and measure up against those guys there. And I think... Uh, the top picture is just an example of sort of the boat trucking nicely upwind. This is some Brits that are sailing there. And the, the bottom is an example of the, the nice close racing you can get with big fleets. Um, and you can really travel all around the world and, uh, and there are active fleets uh, all over. Uh, then I put in a couple of links that are uh, kind of fun uh, and some links to the, the associations. Uh, and also to me sailing with my daughter, which is a good example. It's, it's really, you can, you can sail competitively with a lot of different crew weights too. So it's not just, you need a big guy on the wire. It's, it's very well adapted to both sailing with your kids, sailing with your significant other, or, or, have, or youth sailing. Um, so the boat can be pulled up and down in power quite nicely. So I think that's, that's all I, I wanted to say about that. And otherwise there we can uh, meet in the, in the breakout rooms later. Excellent, thanks very much, Rune. All right, we move from the fireball to the 505 with Paul Place. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, yeah, pretty good segue uh, from the fireballs onto the 505s. Uh, they're, they're very similar boat, except ours is a little bit better. Next <laughs> slide, please. And uh, yeah, I say that jokingly, everyone, everyone thinks their boat is, their boat is awesome. Um, so it's, uh, it's 16 foot or, or uh, five and a half meters, so 505. It's a double-handed boat with a, uh, with a trapeze, a uh, two-person boat, and there's a centerboard. So uh, you can, you can, it can capsize and you can go swimming. Um, it's got very good performance in all conditions. You're, you're planing upwind and downwind in, uh, in about 12 knots. 
it's very responsive in light air, which we have a lot of at, uh, at NSC on Lake de Chain. And in, in breeze, it basically just goes faster. It's, uh, it's a very adjustable boat. You can, you can rake the mass and, and adjust it and sail. Some of the top sailors will be out in, in 30 plus knots. Not me just yet. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. Um, so it's an old class that uh, that's still high performance. So if you look at a boat from the 1950s when it was first designed, they'll, they'll look pretty similar. Um, but some things have evolved over time. Um, so the, uh, the, the hull is one design, the sails, the rig, those are all one design. Uh, but kind of like Rune was mentioning with the fireball, the rigging layout is open. So you can kind of tweak it and adjust the, the way the ropes. And I have a photo there of a, of a cockpit of a 505. There's a lot of strings, a lot of spaghetti, but you can uh, set it up for your sailing style. Um, and it, the hull materials are also open. So uh, some of the boats that were made with, uh, with more modern materials like epoxy, Kevlar, honeycomb in the 1980s, those boats are still just as stiff as they were back then and they're still quite competitive. So there's, it's not uncommon for people to be sailing 20 or 30 old boats and be pretty uh, close to the top of the fleet. The boat that won the Canadians last year was actually the oldest boat in the fleet. Um, and it's a class that does uh, embrace some new things, some innovations. So they went to a double pole system a few years ago. So there's two spinnaker poles. Uh, they went to a larger kite for downwind in the early 2000s. So you can wire run in, uh, in less breeze downwind. And uh, those, are, those are some of the, some of the innovations. There's, um, it's, it's one of the most popular one design dinghies in the world. There's been over 9,000 of them built and it's not uncommon for uh, the world to have over hundred boats. Next slide, please. And right. we skipped one. Oh, sorry. There we go, okay. So who's the boat for? It's, uh, it's for just about anyone, uh, but you, knew, you do need an athletic crew, uh, someone who's very agile. You need, um, you, can, you can combine an athletic crew with, with smaller drivers. There's a lot of uh, husband and wife teams at NSC. We have a lot of uh, children sailing with their parents and uh, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of uh, fun combinations. It does, it does help to be heavier in the breeze though. Um, next slide, please. So at NSC, we have about 12 boats and a couple of others at BYC. We do weekly Wednesday night racing. Uh, we'll travel out of town to some regattas to Kingston, Toronto, the US East Coast. And like all the other fleets here, we're happy to give anyone a ride who's interested and show you guys the boat. And uh, yeah, hope to see some of you in the breakout room. Great, thank you very much, Paul. And finally, we come to the Viper, Steve Chapman. Mm, last but not least, hopefully. Uh, I, I've been really enjoying the presentations. It's, uh, it, it, everybody loves their boat, it's, it's very clear. Um, the Viper is actually a, a boat which is also quite easy to sail, fun and fast. Uh, you know, it's it's one of its unique characteristics is that the one design rules that we're applying have been designed really carefully to keep the cost down. It's a very active class association. We put on some great events. And we've got fairly flexible crewing options. You'll see everything from adults with children, maybe not young children, but I'd say young teenagers, uh, multiple, you know, boats with two couples, uh, you know, all, all ages. There's a lot of crews who are in their 60s and 70s, and there are also crews that are in their 20s and 30s. So it covers a wide range of, of crews. And we've got a lot of great events. It's a very social class, and it's also very, very competitive and very fun. Next slide, please. In, in Ottawa, uh, we're part of a, a Great Lakes region for the Viper fleet. Uh, we've got six boats in Ottawa and there are two new ones on order coming in uh, this spring. Uh, there are 22 in Ontario, Quebec uh, and a total of about 35 boats just in the Great Lakes region and it's growing reasonably quickly. There are over 300 boats built and the builder is still building new boats. We're, we're coming out of a quiet COVID period, but uh, the fleet is still growing. 
as a Great Lakes group, we tend to have one class travel event per month from May to October, uh, one of which is the Nepean One design. And for the last couple of years, we've been the largest fleet at, uh, at Nod. Uh, and we have a winter series in Sarasota in Florida, which is quite attractive to a lot of people. And there's about uh, 22 to 25 boats down there and uh, people travel down for three weekend events uh, in December, January, February, and there's a bigger event in March. Uh, we have an annual North American championship and typically attracts 55 or so boats. Uh, the next one's in Gulfport, Mississippi. And the, but in 2023, the, the North Americans are going to be in Nepean. And uh, we've got events planned out every year for the next four or five years. Next slide, please. For us, the Viper is all about fun. It's about going fast and having fun. It's about uh, competitive racing. And all the members have a strong commitment to one design racing and, uh, and, and handicap racing. We're, we're very active on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We are the scratch perf boat in the Pian, not Ottawa. Uh, the boat is quite fast. Um, and it's a great light wind boat. When other boats are really struggling, the Viper will sail very nicely in a light breeze. Uh, the boat just keeps moving. Most importantly, though, it's very easy to transition on the water from light breeze to heavy breeze. Uh, the Viper planes very easily in moderate breeze, often speeding past 16 to 17 knots in a fair breeze. And the class record so far is 23 and a half knots, and people are learning how to sail it even faster. The nice thing about it, it's very comfortable to sail, easy to rig and tune, simple controls, and the boat only weighs 340 kilograms, so it's very easy to tow. Next slide, please. And for a lot of us, it's all about value. You know, we don't want to spend a lot of money in our boats. We want to spend money having fun. Uh, so the boats are easy to maintain. There's no exotics, no carbon fiber or, or, or fancy composites in the hull. The older boats remain competitive for many years. In fact, this year, the North Americans, the boat that won was six or seven years old. Uh, Second-hand boat market's very strong. Boats can be had anywhere from about $8,000 to $24,000. Mm -hmm. And we limit the set of sales to one set per year. So you really can't spend a lot of money on sales either. And in the class as a whole, competitively, no paid pros are allowed. So it keeps, keeps the cost down. Next slide, please. And for us, it's all about the people. It's uh, fun people who like the excitement of a dinghy or a catamaran, but have desire to transition to a slightly more uh, secure keelboat. Uh, lots of fun and competition. We do have pros racing in the class, but they're not paid to race in the class. So people come to our class to race because it's so competitive. But on top of that, we have a very strong sharing culture and always have debriefs, people sharing how they do things and what they do to make the boats go fast. So everybody has fun. And that's all I've got to say. Hopefully see you in the breakout rooms. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Steve. Appreciate that.